So hidden surface removal, this is um, essentially the next stage in what I'm going to refer back to as a graphics rendering pipeline. So this is, remember, it's kind of like a flow diagram, and it's the stages which we have to go through in order to create a virtual world and then show it on the screen. Uh, just to sort of very, very quick recap from where we are, this is sort of term one stuff. We looked at, we could define objects, and remember the objects are defined in their own space and usually centered at the origin. We apply scale rotation and translation operations to actually build our world space. So that was, if you refer back to assignment five. Then we have to align, so we rotate the whole world space so that our sort of direction of view is looking along the z-axis. And then we project onto the viewing plane, so obviously we're restricted to 2D representation. And we also clip, so that's removing anything which is outside of our visible region and we clip that to the edges of the screen. So what we're going to be looking at today is this box here, hidden surface removal. Okay, so hidden surfaces will be removed, and I'll explain what they are in a minute. Okay, so after clipping, you may have the virtual world, and it looks something like that. Okay, so um, quite difficult to actually see what's going on. This is actually sort of a an attempt at a house, three houses in a row, and a kind of church behind it. And the reason it's difficult to see what's going on is this is what we call a wireframe representation. I haven't filled in any of the polygons, um, I just represented the polygons by their edges. Okay. So it's difficult to see what's going on. So that's after we've clipped to the viewing region. Okay, so this, I'm going to use the uh, what what is known as U, the Utah teapot, um, often also known as Newell's teapot. Um, I'm going to use this to demonstrate what we mean by hidden surface removal. Okay, on the left, you can see that the teapot is an enclosed object. Okay, it's like an object which you have uh, in a virtual world. It's an enclosed object. It's made up of quite a few. I think there's something like thirty-two thousand polygons here. So you can see the sort of square or quadrilateral polygons. And this is all of the polygons that have been drawn. Okay, and what you can see is it looks see-through. You can see through to the back of the teapot object. Okay, so it's not very realistic. Now the one on the right is exactly the same objects, exactly the same polygons. And what I've done here is I haven't plotted the polygons which, as a viewer, we shouldn't be able to see. Okay, so as a viewer, if this was a solid object, an opaque object, you can't see what's behind it. You can't see what's going on behind this wall because it's opaque. So you don't, it doesn't matter what's going on behind it. That, that's all a hidden region to you. The same thing with this teapot. We can't see what the back of the teapot looks like. Okay, so, and it gives you a much better so sort of more realistic, solid 3D um, view. <clears throat> okay, so that's what we're going to be looking at today. Just to, I sort of mentioned the Utah teapot last week. Uh, you may see it popping up if you do some extra reading or uh, investigation in graphics. And essentially, back in the sort of early 70s, um, Martin Yule, who's kind of the early graphics pioneer, needed a test object and he decided to use his teapot. So in all of his papers and stuff, he'd always use the same object. So it's become a bit of an in-joke. Okay, so you often see things. I showed you this um, screenshot of Toy Story. You can see the teapot there. There's one in The Simpsons. I don't know whether you can see that very well. One of the episodes of The Simpsons, Homer goes into some weird dimension, and the teapot's in the background. So that's kind of a little bit of a side note. So you, you may often see me using this object as well. 
Okay, and we're going to be looking at various methods. There are more than one method, like with clipping, there's more than one methods to do it. Um, some of these methods are used in conjunction with um, other methods. Some of them um, use for certain situations. Okay, we will be considering four main methods. Um, the one we're going to be doing this morning is back face culling, which is part of your or question one from assignment seven. Painter's algorithm is another method, Z buffer. And, and finally, we're going to be looking at something called binary space partitioning, which is also part of assignment seven. Right, onto the maths. Okay, very, very important in hidden surface removal is that we have a normal vector for our polygons. And up until now, it doesn't really matter which direction a normal vector faces, but now it starts to matter. Okay. Um, just to refresh your memory, a normal vector points perpendicularly away from the plane. Okay. So if I have, here I've got a, a, a polygon, and obviously if this is, the polygon is a two-dimensional two object, it exists on a plane, and a normal vector points perpendicularly away from the plane. Now a normal vector can point one of two directions. In this case I've drawn it going up. Okay, but a perfectly valid normal vector could be facing down. But we need to remove that ambiguity. Okay, so essentially what we always do is convention is we list vertices in the anti-clockwise order, sorry, anti-clockwise order, if we're looking towards a normal vector. So if the normal vector is facing towards us, we list our vertices in an anti-clockwise order. So you can see we've got V1, V2, V3, V4 in that direction. Down on this polygon, the normal vector will be pointing towards me. The reason we do that is because to calculate the cross product, we uh, sorry, to calculate the normal vector, we simply find the cross product of any two vectors on that plane. And the convention is, if we listed them in an anti-clockwise order, our first vector A would be the, the first vertex pointing towards the second vertex, so V2 minus V1. And our second vector B could be V3 minus V2. So if we always use the anti-clockwise order, and we always use the sequential vertices in this way, we get our normal vectors pointing in the direction we want them. Okay, so why do we want our normal vectors pointing in a particular direction? Well, the first technique we'll be looking at is called back-based colours. And we label a polygon as either being front or back-facing. Now, a polygon is front-facing if its normal vector is pointing towards the viewer. Else, if the normal vector is pointing away, it's back facing. So here we have the viewer. So at some point P, okay, at the top polygon, I draw this in 2D, but imagine if it's 3D as well, has a normal vector facing this way, and it's kind of facing towards the uh, the viewer. Okay, not facing directly towards it, but this front, this side of this polygon can be seen by the viewer. The polygon down here, normal vector is facing away, so this is known as a back-facing polygon. So if, if we consider this side of the polygon to be the front region, the front region is facing away from our viewer. What does this mean? Well, when we're creating a virtual world, if we have a wall, we need two polygons to represent the wall. Because, for example, on the left-hand side here, we need one polygon with a normal vector facing this way. So for anyone, if, you, if the camera position is in this region here, we can see that wall. Or, for outside of it, the other side of the wall, we need another polygon. So when, when you create a virtual world, this is something you may have to consider. So, and if you've taken closed objects, okay, so objects, which, where the camera, the camera will never enter that object. Okay, it's considered a closed object, we've got the teapot, the barrel, could be anything. 
you design it so your normal vectors are always facing away from the center of the object. Okay, so this brings us on to back face culling, and it does what it says. Okay, it culls, it removes any surfaces that are back facing to the viewer. In other words, uh, the normal vectors are facing away. So in this diagram here, we've got the viewer, and we're looking at this sort of hexagonal object. So this he hexagonal object is created by six polygons A through to F. Okay, and each of these polygons have the normal vectors pointing away from the center of the object. Now, only three of those normal vectors, or three of these polygons, are front face into the viewer. And that's A, B, and C. Polygons D, E, and F, they're pointing away from the viewer, so they're considered back facing. So what this means is if I was to draw this object, I don't need to draw polygons D, E, and F because they're not seen. So what essentially this means is I've cut down on the amount of polygons which I have to draw by 50%. Okay, so how do we determine whether you're front and back facing? Now, we have eyes, it's dead easy to see. Computers, as I keep saying, don't have eyes. They deal with numbers. And this is the information we, we, we have. We've got a point P, which is our viewpoint. We have polygons, and it's quite easy to determine the center of each of our polygons, C. And we have normal vectors, and that's, again, that's from the information from the polygon. For the front-facing one, if I draw a viewing vector V, which goes from P through to the, through the center of that polygon, the angle between the viewing vector V and the normal vector is greater than 90 degrees. So this is for a uh, front-facing polygon. This angle here, is an obtuse angle, it's greater than 90, or pi over 2. Alternatively, the back facing polygon, if I do exactly the same, put the view vector going through CB, okay, and I'd like to have a look at the angle between the view vector V and the normal vector N, we can see we have an acute angle, which is less than pi over 2. Okay, so we're looking at the angles. Well, we're not actually, because angles mean expensive cosine calculations. So what we can use is our old friend, the dot product. Now, if I think back to the definition of the dot product, so any two vectors, let's say V and N, the dot product is equal to the magnitude multiplied together, multiplied by the cosine and the angle between them. But in this case, we're only interested whether the angle is greater or less than pi over 2. Now, the cosine of an angle which is less than pi over 2 can be positive. It's going to be somewhere between 0 and 1. The cosine of an angle which is greater than pi over 2 is going to be negative. Okay, somewhere between 0 and minus 1. So I don't really care how big that angle is. I just can care whether it's greater or less than pi over 2. So essentially we say... If the angle is greater than pi over 2, the cosine of that angle is going to be negative. So therefore, if you calculate the dot product between V, the viewing vector, and that normal, or that polygon, if that's negative, it's front-facing. Else, if it's positive, it's back-facing. So it's a, it's a very easy calculation, a very easy way to determine whether something's front or back-facing. Okay, and this brings us on to the algorithm. Okay, it's kind of written as algorithms are, as a sort of pseudo code. Okay, so what we require for the back face is vertex coordinates of polygons and where we're viewing from. from. In practice, where we're viewing from will always be the, the um, origin. Because we, before we got to this stage, we aligned it and done all that uh, gubbins. Okay, but you know, it, it works for many um, viewpoints. So if you're all your polygons in the virtual world are actually all your polygons after you've clipped it. Okay, you calculate the normal vector, 
if you're carrying polygons. So you're looping, you're taking each polygon one at a time, calculate the normal vector, calculate the center of your current polygon, then you, that allows you to calculate the viewing vector V, and you simply find the dot product between V and N, if that's negative, you render it. You, that's something you're going to plot. If it's not, you just ignore it, and you move to the next one. Okay, so there's an example. Actually, I'm going to show you a bit more of a I'll show you this working. Yeah, yeah. that's the uh, teapot I've drawn. I've just drawn that using MATLAB. Um, and as you can see, viewed from that direction, it looks like a solid teapot. Well, if I sort of grab it and rotate it around. Oh, that's slow. There you can see. You can see, even though it's a solid teapot from one direction, any or the whole of the back end of the teapot has been ignored. I haven't bothered rendering it. So whilst it looks solid to the viewer, you've only bothered with half of the polygons. So if I put it back, yeah, this is running a wee bit slow, but if I try and put it back to the, where we viewed it from, ah, it's not going to work. Uh, about there. Oh. Went too far. But you can see from the front, you can see it looks like a solid teapot. That's what I meant. So that on the right, you can see. I haven't. So the view position is still. I'm still viewing this teapot here from somewhere down here. Okay, I'll just sort of. If I could turn around, I could you know matrix style. Okay, so that's back face colour. Quite simple. Okay. Um, what I've done is I've applied it to that uh, wireframe image which we saw at the beginning, and you can see it has removed the hidden surfaces, so our buildings do look solid. We've got a, quite an obvious problem there. Okay, we've got a church which should be behind the front building has been rendered in front of it. Okay, so while back face colour does work. We've also got to do other things, and that's what I'm going to be looking at in the uh, second lecture. Okay, just to finish off this session, I'm just going to come around with another one of my work examples, and we're going to have a look at applying back face spelling to a simple object. <coughs> By the way, before I go on, any questions? Fairly simple stuff.